Welcome to the fourth video in the Essential Extract of Complex Analysis series. In this video, we're going to talk about complex line integrals. If you want more details about the topics covered in this series as a whole, see the video description below. The topics that we're going to cover in this video are the definition of the complex line integral, the cauchy goursat theorem, the Cauchy integral formula, and Morera's theorem. The last three topics are all very important results which get you a long way into the subject. Let's begin with the definition of the complex line integral. The fast definition, which is all you're going to need to remember after you've done enough examples, is this. The complex differential dz is defined to be dx plus i dy. The integral over gamma of f of z dz is then given by the integral over gamma of f of z dx plus i times the integral over gamma of f of z dy. Here gamma is a piecewise smooth oriented curve in the complex plane and f is a continuous complex valued function on gamma. If you're already comfortable doing line integrals from multivariable calculus, this may be all the information that you need at this point. However, for the sake of people who want to see more details, I'd like to unpack this definition just a little more. First of all, let's suppose that the real and imaginary parts of our piecewise smooth curve gamma are parametrized by x of t and y of t as t runs from a to b. Here's the definition that we just gave. Now, the two integrals on the right-hand side are line integrals with respect to the differentials dx and dy. By the way, to evaluate the line integral of a complex valued function, you can just split it into real and imaginary parts and evaluate the line integrals of the real and imaginary parts separately. In any case, if I just use the definition of the line integral from multivariable calculus, the first integral is equal to the integral from a to b of f of gamma of t x prime of t dt, and the second piece here is equal to i times the integral from a to b of f of gamma of t y prime of t dt. If I recombine the integrands, then I can remember this in a succinct way by the formula integral from a to b of f of gamma of t, gamma prime of t dt. You need to remember this because, even after we develop the powerful machinery that we're about to see, there still are going to be times when you actually have to compute complex line integrals. We could spend a lot of time on examples, but there's one example in particular that's going to be very important to us going forward. Let's suppose that n is an integer, and let's try to compute the complex line integral of the function z to the n around the curve gamma, which traverses the unit circle in the complex plane one time, starting from the point one and moving in the counterclockwise direction. First of all, we'd like a parametrization of this curve. A nice parametrization of this curve is given by gamma of t equals e to the two pi i t, t going from zero to one. When we compute the derivative of this function with respect to t, we get gamma prime of t equals 2 pi i times e to the 2 pi i t. I didn't split this into real and imaginary parts to do this calculation, but you can verify easily that it's true. Now when we substitute everything into the definition that we gave, we get that the integral around gamma of f of z dz is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the 2 pi i n t times 2 pi i times e to the 2 pi i t dt. Cleaning this up, it's 2 pi i times the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the 2 pi i times n plus 1 times t dt. This is an integral that you can do just using basic calculus. If you're still not comfortable evaluating integrals of complex valued functions, like I said before, you can separate the integrand out into real and imaginary parts and do them separately. When you do that, you're going to find that the value of the integral depends on what n is. If n is negative 1, then the integrand is just the constant function 1, and the integral just evaluates to 2 pi i. On the other hand, when n is not negative 1, the integral evaluates to 0. It's worth keeping this example in mind because it's going to come up again later. By this point, we've come a long way, and we're ready for our first big theorem. Let's suppose that d is a bounded, open, and connected subset of the complex plane, and that the boundary of d is piecewise smooth. To be bounded, of course, means that d is contained in a large enough disk in the complex plane. We already talked about the definition of open sets in the previous video. For a subset of the complex plane to be connected means that it's not a disjoint union of two open subsets of the complex plane. Intuitively, connectedness of an open subset of the complex plane means what you probably think it does. In particular, connectedness of open subsets of the complex plane is equivalent to path connectedness of those sets. That is, that every pair of points in the set can be joined by a continuous curve which lies completely in the set. The yellow set that I've shaded here, not including the purple boundary points, is an example of a set satisfying these hypotheses. Given such a set D, let's suppose that we have a function f which is analytic on D and which extends smoothly to the boundary boundary of D. When I say that f extends smoothly to the boundary of d here, what I really mean is that there's an open set containing the boundary on which f is analytic. The cauchy goursat theorem says that when these hypotheses are satisfied, it's always the case that the integral around the boundary of d of f of z dz is equal to zero. 
A couple important pieces of notation here. This symbol with a partial D denotes the boundary of the region D. Also, this circle on the integral sign denotes that I'm taking what's called the positive orientation around the boundary. It's important to understand what's meant by positive orientation. As you're walking around the boundary of D, you're moving in what's called the positive orientation if, when you stick your left hand out, it points in the direction of D. So for pieces of the boundary that are on what we would call the outside of the region, the positive orientation is the counterclockwise direction. But for pieces of the boundary that are on what we would call the inside of the region, positive orientation is the clockwise direction. If you don't take the integral in the cauchy gorsat theorem around all the pieces of your boundary in the positive orientation, then the integral might not come out to be zero. It's a good exercise for us to try to prove the cauchy gorsat theorem. Let's suppose that f and d satisfy the hypotheses of the theorem. We start with the definition of the integral around the boundary of d of f of z dz. If we write u and v for the real and imaginary parts of the function f, then the first integral is the integral of u plus iv dx, and after we factor the i in, the second integral is the integral of minus v plus i times u dy. You might remember seeing integrals like this in multivariable calculus. If you do, then you might recognize that this is an integral that we can apply Green's theorem to. Green's theorem tells us that this integral is equal to the double integral over d of the partial derivative of the second piece with respect to x minus the partial derivative of the first piece with respect to y. When you combine the real parts of the integrand, you get minus the partial of u with respect to x minus the partial of u with respect to y. However, since f is analytic on d, that quantity is equal to zero because of the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Similarly, when you combine the imaginary parts in the integrand, you get i times the partial of u with respect to x minus the partial of u with respect to y, and that's also equal to zero on d because of the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Since the integrand is always zero, this double integral is equal to zero, and that completes the proof of the theorem. Our next important theorem is the Cauchy integral formula. Let's suppose that d and f satisfy the hypotheses of the cauchy gorsat theorem. In other words, d is bounded, open, and connected, and has piecewise smooth boundary, and f is analytic on d and extends smoothly to the boundary of d. Then it follows that for any point z in d and for any non-negative integer n, the value of the nth derivative of f at z is given by n factorial divided by 2 pi i times the integral around the positively oriented boundary of d of f of w divided by w minus z to the power n plus 1 dw. This is a central theorem in this subject which is used to prove many other results. Because of this, it's a good idea for us at this point to spend some time trying to prove it. That way we can understand what it's really saying. First, let's consider how to prove the n equals zero case of the theorem. What we're trying to show in this case is that for any point z in the set d, f of z is equal to one over two pi i times the integral around the boundary of d of f of w divided by w minus c. The function f is analytic everywhere inside d. By the properties of analytic functions that we talked about in the last video, that means that the function f of w divided by w minus z is analytic everywhere on the set d minus the point z. Since d is an open set, we can put a ball of small enough radius around the point z so that that ball is entirely contained in the set d. Then if we consider the set of points which are in d but outside of that closed disk centered at z, that's going to be an open set on which the integrand is analytic everywhere. Therefore, if we apply the cauchy gorsat theorem to that yellow region, we get that the integral around its boundary of f of w divided by w minus z is equal to zero. That means the integral around the positively oriented outside part of the boundary and the positively oriented inside part of the boundary have to cancel each other out. By an almost identical analysis to the one that we used earlier in the video to evaluate the integral of z to the n around the unit circle, it's not difficult to show that the integral in the middle here is equal to 2 pi i times f of z. That finishes the n equals zero proof of the theorem. If n is bigger than zero, we can just differentiate both sides n times. We can justify bringing the derivative with respect to z inside the integral sign, and that gives exactly the formula that we're looking for. I guess that one other point is that not every region D satisfying the hypotheses looks like this one, but the ideas that we've shown here are the main ideas in the proof of the theorem. So that essentially completes the proof of the theorem. The third important theorem that I want to talk about in this video is Morera's theorem. Before I tell you the statement of Morera's theorem, first of all note that if you have any piecewise smooth closed curve gamma and any function f which is analytic on the region that gamma bounds, then it follows from the cauchy gorsat theorem that the integral around gamma of f of z dz is equal to zero. Morera's theorem provides a partial converse to this observation. 
Let's suppose that you have an open and connected subset D of the complex plane. It doesn't necessarily have to be bounded. And let's also suppose that we have a function f from D to C which is continuous. Notice that continuity is all I'm assuming about this function at the outset. Under these hypotheses, if it happens that for every closed rectangle R with sides parallel to the real and imaginary axes, the integral around the boundary of R of f of z dz is equal to zero, then f is analytic on D. This is the statement of Morera's theorem. Morera's theorem is a powerful tool for showing that certain functions are analytic. I'd like to demonstrate that now by showing you two very important examples. The first example is the gamma function. Despite the strange looking definition, this turns out to be a central function in both mathematics and in physics. First of all, I'm going to leave it to you to check that when you evaluate this function at a positive integer n, you get n minus 1 factorial. However, the integral defining the gamma function is actually absolutely convergent for any complex number z satisfying real part of z bigger than zero. Therefore, this gives you a way of extending the definition of the factorial function all the way to the right half of the complex plane. Actually, we're going to see in a later video that you can extend the definition even further, but for right now, let's just think about this. There are many different ways to extend the definition of a function to a larger domain, so how do we know that this is the right one in this instance? Well, if we could convince ourselves that this is actually an analytic function of z in the right half plane, real part of z bigger than zero, that would make a strong case for considering it as a nice generalization of the factorial. This function does actually turn out to be analytic in that region. If you try to show that using something like the Cauchy-Riemann equations, you're probably going to have a hard time. But it turns out to be relatively easy to show by using Morera's theorem. With a view towards using Morera's theorem, let's pick any rectangle in the right half plane real part of z bigger than zero with sides parallel to the real and imaginary axes. What we would like to show is that the integral around the boundary of a rectangle like that is always equal to zero. Well, if you look at the definition of the gamma function, you might notice that for any real number t bigger than zero, the integrand is an analytic function of z. Therefore, if we could justify interchanging the order of integration here, then on the inner integral, we would have a chance of using the cauchy gorsat theorem. It turns out that you can justify interchanging the order of integration by an application of Fubini's theorem. I'll leave this for you to verify. It is a technical part of the argument that needs to be checked. However, once you've justified interchanging the order of integration, then, as we said, the inner integral is equal to zero by the cauchy gorsat theorem. It follows that the integral around the boundary of every rectangle R contained in this region is equal to zero. And that allows us to conclude, based on Morera's theorem, that the gamma function is analytic in the right half plane real part of z bigger than zero. For our second application of Morera's theorem, I'd like to talk about the Riemann zeta function. Those of you who have heard about the Riemann hypothesis may recognize this function. Understanding the zeros of the meromorphic continuation of this function to the complex plane is a million dollar question in mathematics. Don't worry if you don't understand what all those words mean right now, we'll talk about that a little more later in this series. For now, I just want to show that the Riemann zeta function is analytic in the right half plane, real part of s bigger than 1. s here denotes a complex number. It's common in analytic number theory, which is the home base of this function, to use s instead of z. You might remember from calculus that series of this form converge for real numbers s bigger than 1, and they diverge for real numbers s less than or equal to 1. If you just write 1 over n to the s as e to the minus s times the principal value of the logarithm of n, then it's a pretty easy exercise to show that in fact series of this form are absolutely convergent for any complex number s lying in the region real part of s bigger than 1. In other words, for any complex number lying to the right of this orange dashed line that I've illustrated. What we'd like to show is that in fact this definition of the Riemann zeta function defines an analytic function in that region. We can do that without too much difficulty by using Morera's theorem. Pick any rectangle with sides parallel to the real and imaginary axes lying in the region real part of s bigger than 1. What we want to show is that the integral around the boundary of any such rectangle of zeta s is equal to 0. Since zeta s is defined as the sum of 1 over n to the s, and since each one of the functions 1 over n to the s is analytic in the region real part of s bigger than 1, as in the previous example, what we'd like to do here is interchange the order of integration and summation. Then we can appeal to the cauchy gorsat theorem to show that the integral of 1 over n to the s is 0. As before, we can appeal to a generalized form of Fubini's theorem to justify interchanging the order of integration and summation. 
This is the only tricky part of the proof, and I'm not gonna show all the details of how to justify it. But what we really need to know in order to justify it is that the series converges uniformly on regions R like the one that I've described. I'll remind you about the definition of uniform convergence in just a second because it fits in with something else that I wanna say. Anyway, if you believe me that that step is justified, then we're essentially done with this example. Each one of the integrals of one over n to the s over the boundary of r is zero by the cauchy gorsat theorem. Therefore, the integral of the zeta function around the boundary is zero. Therefore, by Morera's theorem, we conclude that the zeta function is analytic in the region real part of s bigger than one. We'll talk in a later video about how to extend the zeta function to a function which is analytic on an even larger region. Finally, you might have noticed a similarity in the arguments that we used in the previous two examples. In both examples, there was a step where we had to justify interchanging an integral with some other limiting process. That kind of argument can be generalized in several ways. One way is what I'm showing you here. Let's suppose that you have a sequence of functions fn and that each function fn is an analytic function on an open connected set d. If the sequence of functions fn converges uniformly on d to a function f, then it follows that the integral over any rectangle in d of the limit of the fn's is equal to the limit of the integrals. So by the same kind of argument that we used in the previous two examples, this allows us to conclude that the function f is also an analytic function on d. Just to make sure that we're all clear about what it means for fn to converge to f uniformly on d, I've provided the definition here. It means that for any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a number capital N with the property that for any little n bigger than capital N and for any z in d, the modulus of the difference of fn of z minus f of z is less than epsilon. In other words, from some point on in the sequence, it doesn't matter what point z in d you plug in to fn, you have to be within epsilon of the target value of f at that point. This criterion is useful in many instances for proving that functions defined by limiting processes, such as infinite series, are analytic on certain regions d. That concludes this video. Please like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel for more.